we took our um, our species of uh, special concern and divvied them up into two tiers, prioritized them as far as what we thought would either require, you know, additional information um, for proposal <laughs> and the likelihood. That was, that was just our approach to that. And we review that, um, you know, when we think about, okay, what, um, are there any species that should go be considered for um, threatened or endangered or what, might be more information we need about a species in order to approach it with that in mind. Mm -hmm. Just just for reference. OK, thanks. My, I, yeah, and I was going to say my suggestion would be just, um, you know, and it's possible, um, you know, the the threat matrix that you use might not be applicable to, you know, to some of the other taxa, but I think it would be great to just present your ta uh, threat matrix at an ESC meeting. So, you know, just to share it with the yeah. other SAGs, um, you know, what are some of the criteria you're using? Um, obviously, you know, the other piece of the puzzle that potentially comes into play is update of the wildlife action plan and whether that, you know, sort of moves any species um, up into, you know, species that could be um, designated species of greatest conservation need. I think the other one that, um, and um, you know, Bob and John, you can you can jump in here. Is I think with some of the you know the Act 250 or Act 248 permits that species of special concern are at least considered there. I mean, sometimes that's you know that may be something that um, fish and wildlife folks look at when there's a um, a, a development proposal. Not that it could necessarily stop the permit, but yeah. you do take those into consideration. Do, do, do you want to? I'll give you the short answer to that, at least with plants. Yeah. We have no jurisdiction over rare plants in Act 250. Zero. Yeah. Uh, only T and E. Okay. Yeah. With Section 248, which is energy permits, we have been <clears throat> protecting rare plants. So that is not listed once. Yeah. There's an applicant for a solar project in Bennington who appealed that, and it went to the state Supreme Court, uh, appealed the, the state's ability to protect rare plants because they, they're, they're contending we have no authority. Mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court essentially made a non-decision. They're saying we're not the entity to decide this. It needs to go to the Public Utilities Commission. Okay. So we're anticipating an appeal to the Public Utilities Commission over that very that very um, fact, and yeah. you know, up till now, we we've been, you know, we've been protecting them. And the lawyers, the, the attorneys I spoke to in house, are optimistic that the Public Utilities Commission will side with us, just because of precedent mm -hmm. that we've been protecting rare okay. plants in Section Two Forty Eight yeah. for about the last, you know, five or six years. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It is kind of nebulous. It says yeah. there will be no undue adverse effect to the natural environment. So rare plants are part of the natural environment. Yeah, it's like a direct nexus, but it's mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah, obviously lawyers can fight over that for years. Yeah. Okay. No, that's so good. anyway, that was the short answer. <laughs> well, I don't know about animals. If anyone has a better, I mean, we protect yeah. wildlife habitat. <clears throat> I, I think, I think the SC designation does make a difference in the public's mind when they see SC after species, whether or not it has any legal status or not. Um, and, and it does to me, and it does when I teach. I mean, to put that label after a species does mean this is a species we ought to be looking at. Uh, you know, so I think it does make some difference whether or not it has any particular legal standing. Yeah, it will also provide funding if and when RAWA passes. Anything that's designated as a species of greatest conservation need will be eligible for RAWA funding. Right. Yeah. A big concern. I think most yeah, I think of our bird species are species on that list. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we picked from that list when I we made that species, the species of greatest conservation need. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't been paying attention in terms of order here. Roz, you want to go? 
Sure, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to point out that, um, I mean, special concern has been used pretty internally in terms of us helping us to do, to get a top priority list of you know what we need action on or what we need to keep careful eye on or what we need more information for. Um, it's I think it's and I don't have an immediate solution for this, but I think it's confusing to the public when we talk about special conserva special concern and then we talk about species of greatest conservation need. Um, and I don't know it. I think we. I think um, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but I think it can, and I know it does create some confusion, and people don't know how severe a warning each of those labels are, and and what to make of them. Um, so I think we just have to be mindful of that <laughs> when we're bringing these terms out into the public realm. But that said, we use either one of those designations in the 248 process to um, you know, to bring to attention that it's not just your everyday species and there's certain needs. But but really, I sometimes I just wonder if we can't go with S1, S2, but but use a different name for them or something and just be consistent. But just a side side note. Yeah. No, thanks. Uh, Rich and Carla. Yeah, um, when I was writing um, the uh, permits for the aquatic nuisance control, uh, which included lampreside, um, we did consider special concern and rarity of, of, of fish species. Um, me personally, um, used to go to bat for that. And I, in, in terms of how much difference it made, I don't really know. But um, I think they are still cognizant of the rarity of fish species when considering um, aquatic nuisance control permits. Okay. Yeah, Carla. <clears throat> yeah, I was just going to um, tack on, I guess, to some of what's already been said. Um, but as from the sort of consultant perspective, and oftentimes working between a, a client and the agency, either through Act 250 or Section 248. Um, just to point out the nuance between a rare, threatened, and endangered species and a uncommon or greatest conservation need species, and a, a developer, a, a applicant, um, would not need to uh, put forth any conservation measures and have have pushed back against agency concerns in looking at a S3 species versus something that, you know, by the book is considered rare, meaning S2 or S1, so that um, the state rank is is really the, the clincher under a um, 248 or 250 proceeding. Yeah, okay. So, uh, great. Go ahead. Alan, you wanted to have an opportunity to tell us people who wrote annual reports uh, about how you would like the annual report structured. Oh, yeah, I guess. I mean, this was just um, I don't know. I mean, we've you know, it's been sort of free form, but I guess I was I was kind of wondering if it made sense to actually just start the annual report with um with listing critical habitat permits um and you know those are those are sort of the three um items that you know are basically sort of pushed up from the sag to the endangered species committee and just wondering if that makes sense in terms of a way to you know sort of organize and then you know all the stuff that you've got in there your 25 pages jim that's i mean that's great to have that in there and i, I mean because i i think we don't Hmm. really have a, a great um, way of archiving sort of the minutes. I mean, you know, I know the bird tag has an incredible minute taker, but it's, you know, but that hasn't really been archived. And so I think this is a great way to keep track of what's happening with the SAGs over the course of a year, but also just kind of thinking, you know, listing critical habitat permitting, maybe, you know, the first, you know, first three sections of a SAG. Membership. membership yeah membership changes yeah yeah so that has yeah. to go through yes right yeah 
Easy enough to do. Maybe just if you send out a reminder before you ask for annual reports next yeah, time. No. Yeah. Thanks for that, Jim. <clears throat> All right. Um, in terms of membership, um, we did lose Rebecca Chalmers, who had been a member of the SAG for many years, and we lost Alan Calfee, who was the ESC representative on the SAG, and we picked up Carla, who is now uh, the ESC representative on our SAG. Um, <clears throat> the pond slider we learned uh, based uh, as a result of our pond slider recommendation that that really was something that uh, needed to be addressed through a number of channels that we really didn't have a full appreciation for the fact that there's the, the aquatic nuisance control statute, which was <clears throat> ANR, but not fish and wildlife, and is a legislative process. The restricted species list, which was fish and wildlife with the wardens, um, Education and legal uh, prohibition, that was kind of going down a different <clears throat> um, channel uh, that required resources. Um, so it was kind of an education to realize that uh, it needed to, our recommendations needed to be dealt with. If we were to deal with them, they had to be dealt with through two or three different processes and, and actually two or three different um um departments but work is being done and it's interesting um and and we're appreciative to see that discussions are ongoing and uh progress is being made um let's see in terms of <clears throat> protection for non-game reptiles and amphibians i mean our our initial recommendation there was no open season uh, on wild non-avian reptiles and, and wild amphibians. Um, <clears throat> and and it has, that recommendation has, has also started down a couple paths. One is uh, bag limits, uh, suggested bag limits and seasons for some of the common herps that have been traditionally eaten or hunted or used for bait. And then a separate direction for a list of species that would not be, that would not have open seasons and bag limits. And the way I understand it is both those conversations are taking place, um, but it's forked and it's it's going down two different two different paths. And and um, feel free to to correct me on any of this, Roz, if if I'm not representing the process right. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. My puppy relocation is going on. <clears throat> Mark Ferguson's put in a lot of effort there. Moved 114 mud puppies upstream of the Lampreside treatment area in the Lamoille River. He'll be working on that again next year. <clears throat> Spiny softshell critical habitat has been uh, designated and finalized. Um, We've been working as we discussed on special concern. We didn't find any box turtles at all this year. Uh, none were reported. And we still have um, the three species that we do not get records on um, and did not this year. Fallus toad, we got one record last year. North American racer, we last heard about a racer in 2014. Boreal course frog, we last heard about boreal course frog in 1999. Um, not that many exotic species were reported this year. Green anole is the only one that we re got reported and they get brought up in plants. And our next scheduled meeting is, uh, is March 29th. I think that's it, Alan. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> any uh, any questions or comments for Jim? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, Rich, is that a residual hand you've got up, or is it a a new hand?
Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I think Bill, did I have you next? Mammal said before. Yep. My my uh, report's only three pages long, so I guess we didn't do it as much as we uh, heard so. so we did have two meetings this year. Our membership hasn't changed, and we have no new listing. So get those uh, standard things out of the way. We are considering a, a taking permit uh, on Little Brown Bats put forth by Green Mountain Power. And I don't know if John's still there. It looks like he stepped out maybe. But I, I really like the way that we're handling it and that the SAG has uh, been giving the permit. Uh, we're being able to get some additional information through Alyssa Bennett uh, with the, with the uh, uh, person who's applying through Green Mountain Power. That kind of makes our suggestions and our questions go away as we learn more information. So we'll be presenting this to the ESC uh, um, through John uh, shortly, and then uh, I guess discussed at our next meeting. Other things are more just informational. Um, as of January 30th of this month, the Northern Long-Eared Bat uh, will be federally listed as endangered. That has been proposed and uh, approved in, in the federal record. Uh, just skipping through to kind of the most important things. As we talked about uh, earlier, uh, a large Indiana bat summer colony was found uh, in the Heinsberg region. This is on the or northern edge of its known range. So that has uh, significant uh, implications as far as conservation and management. So maybe we should be looking for this bat species uh, further to the north or, or outside of the areas where it was previously thought to be restricted. Going on to uh, um, Martin, uh, another one of our endangered species. Uh, happy to report that uh, there were no takes in the Northeast Kingdom population uh, during the trapping season, but there were two males taken in the southern populations during that last season. Other information that Paul Hapeman, who was doing a, a occupancy study uh, in the southern population, found that there's been no expansion of the American Martin from its previous range that was detected in a number of years ago. So range has not expanded. And the other thing that was of, of significance significance there. The uh, best predictor of where it occurs is what everybody previously thought, and that was the percent of canopy. That accounts for a large proportion of the predictability of its, its occupancy. As I think Mark alluded to uh, at our last meeting, there are reports of declines of weasels range-wide. And this is a substantial report of declines in 87 to 94 percent, and that's from harvest records that have been taken in North America. The, the good news is for us is we looked at the, the study and we looked at the information we have on the uh, take of, of uh, well, there's there's no real uh, information on the take of, of weasels uh, in Vermont. Uh, they're not really monitored, so it was some survey work that uh, people of the uh, endangered species or the mammal sag were doing, and we feel at this point that there's no decline that we detect uh, in, in Vermont at this point in time of either short tail weasel or the long tail weasel. There are substantial changes uh, in the nomenclature, so you if you're interested in nomenclature of weasels, you might take a look at that. Uh, so change in both the species of the short-tailed weasel and changes in the genera of both the long-tailed weasel and the American wink. As I talked about before at one of our last meetings, one of the things of concern is the reverse of gnosis. 
of SARS-CoV-2 from humans moving into white-tailed deer. And there's reports uh, in a number of states of as large as 40% of the white-tailed deer uh, being testing positive for SARS-CoV-2. And a concern, of course, there is that uh, white-tailed deer can develop it to be a reservoir for SARS-CoV-2 and then reverse transcribe that virus back into humans with different strains that we've previously been exposed to. Um, I think I'll leave it at that and, and uh, see if anybody has questions. There are a number of other things that are included in the report. I've tried to include some links to uh, scientific papers as well as other information. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I couldn't find it. I'd love to. Well, okay. Look at it in detail. Yeah, yeah Bill, I, I have it. To... <laughs> okay. I'll send it to yeah, you, Alan, ahead. and you can put it in. Yeah, no, that's okay. fine. Happy to do that. Uh, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, could you just elaborate a tiny bit on the Martin situation? You said there was no um, expansion of range because of what, what was the what was going on there? Something to do with a canopy or? No, no that's that's the uh, the southern population that's been that Paul Hateman has been studying. He found that it it had not expanded since we first discovered it. Uh, no, probably ten years ago. So kind of what the first uh, occupancy study showed for its distribution in, in uh, the southern portion of its range in Vermont, it, it is held steady. It hasn't, hasn't expanded primarily out of the wilderness areas uh, in those southern counties. The, the best predictor of where it occurs, what habitat it occurs in, is the percent of closed canopy. Okay. And it's thought that it needs that closed canopy to escape from from a predator, and that predator primarily being the fisher. So it needs a closed canopy because it's smaller. It can move across that canopy and escape, whereas the fisher gets bogged down in, in the smaller proportions of the trees and has to go to the ground to continue the chase. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Paul? Yeah, makes sense, yeah. But so how big is the range now? I mean, are we talking, you know, 10% of the southern part of the state or, you know, in the, I guess it's in the Green Mountain National Forest. Is that primarily it? It's prim yeah, it's, it's primarily restricted to the wilderness areas there. Okay. And so, oh. you know, it really hasn't, you get males wandering out of that and getting trapped, uh, but there's no indication of, of a reproductive population out of the wilderness areas. So would you consider it sort of an indicator species for not really old growth, but you know, an older class of forest, less disturbed? Yeah. Yeah, it's that that's I think there are two things going on. So certainly less disturbed forest, uh, more complex forest with that closed canopy. The other thing is the damage that roads do um, to that particular habitat or to the to the Martin. So when roads are built in, they allow, they increase the trapper density. They also surprisingly allow routes for travel of animals like foxes, and coyotes into those areas that typically have higher snow levels. And those can be, you know, we usually think of it as being predation, but a part of it is also competition for the prey base, which are primarily bulls on uh, that, that, you know, compete with the, with the prey base for the mark. Great, thanks. Cool. Yeah. Questions or comments for Bill? Uh, 
All right. Ken, did I have you next? Yes, sir. All right. Take it away. All right. Well, first I'll give you the box score for the invertebrate SAG group. We've got the most members we've ever had now. We have 14 members by adding Spencer Hardy upon your vote um, last year. So we're pretty thrilled to have that many people because following up on our box score, we've got 18 invertebrate species that are now listed in the state. One amphipod, 10 mussels, freshwater mussels, three tiger beetles, and four bumblebees. But we've got, as, as uh, Ross Bell said, we've got something like 21,400 invertebrate species, but who the hell knows in Vermont. So we have a lot of work to, to even go through and, and decide what is actually rare and where it is and what's not. So the more people we have on our ISAG, the happier we are because it expands our knowledge base on our group. So um, we're always recruiting and looking for new members. So if you hear of people that maybe have expertise in invertebrates, please do let us know because we, we need actually more people even though we have 14. Um, we had two meetings. What's that? It's only about 1,500 species per person. So yeah, <laughs> it's no big deal. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had two meetings. Um, we're doing well. What's that? No, we're, you're good. Go okay. on. We had two yeah. meetings um, last year, spring and fall meetings, uh, mostly to discuss what we are working on and to push what we're working on forward. We didn't really have any um, listing actions or reviews last year for any endangered species by our group, but we have some ongoing um, studies going on or discussions that may end up coming in front of you. Some of it may end up coming in front of you this year. The first one is the freshwater mussel elk toe. Um, there's been some more surveys done for elk toe. Um, it's an S1 species, both in Vermont and Quebec. And it's only um, along one short stretch of the Lamoille River in Fairfax, and that's the only, in Fairfax and Georgia, and that's the only place it's found in Vermont. And we now, after having uh, several years of surveys done, may have some evidence that they may even be declining in that stretch. And so we're gathering information into a report right now. Um, and if the, once it's gathered into our report in the SAG, we may push it forward as um, bringing it to you as a potential listing for threatened and endangered, but we're not to that stage yet at all. We, we it's not even out of, the, out of our hands at SAG, but we're, we're working on that. So it could be something in, in the fall that if it keeps moving forward and we're, and we think there's enough information that it may come onto your plate in the fall. Um, for a potential listing. Um, the other thing we're working on is one of the first species I think that was ever listed for, for invertebrates was the Taconic Cave Amphipod, which is this little uh, amphipod that exists. It's only known from one place down in Mount Tabor in a cave, um, in a lake at the bottom of a cave. Uh, and the lake is thought to be nine meters deep. Um, there's This cave system is for the longest time was thought to be the only place for this amphipod, but since then it's been found in a cave nearby, well, relatively nearby in New York in the Taconic system. And then there's one record of it now for um, Western Massachusetts out of a, a spring head. Um, and so, you know, these, these caves may all actually be connected somehow um, through that distance. And it, it's also thought that this amphipod actually survived the glaciation in the Taconic Mountains underground while the glaciers were on top of it. So it's been here for a long time. Um, but we're looking at this species now a little bit more closely um, to think about possible critical habitat designation for this cave and around it. And so we're just in the early stages of gathering information on it, who the landowners are um, surficially above the cave. The cave's been well mapped for several decades now. So we know where the cave goes underground for the most part. Um, so we know who the landowners are. We've, we've been figuring out who the landowners are on top and the town of Mount Tabor owns the entrance area and uses that. It's an old quarry along Route 7 and they use that as a transfer station right now. And so we're getting down to the nitty gritty of deciding whether we, we should push forward more for critical habitat designation for this cave. 
Um, and again, that would be another thing that if we do, I would assume by by autumn, by fall this year, we'd, we'd push it towards you um, if we get that far uh, on that species. Um, what else do we have here? Um, we're working on, we're working with the department a lot on trying to get more S rankings for a lot of these groups. Um, I'll talk about it in a second, but we just finished putting S ranks on all the native bee species for that we know for Vermont, 350 species of bees, because um, we finally had enough data for that. And we've done, we're working right now um, on pea clams. We got some designations for those right now on all the pea clams. Um, and, and then there's some other groups where we've gathered enough data, like crickets and grasshoppers and some other things where we're starting to get to the point where we can actually finally at least put some S rankings on them, which is our first cut at like <laughs> looking at some of these groups. Um, and so that we've been working hard with the agency trying to trying to get that done for some of the groups where we now have enough data. Um, a couple updates for threatened and endangered species. Um, we're working on what used to come up for us a lot was uh, was what happens with uh, freshwater mussels when it comes to lamprosad treatments. And back in 2013, we had a white paper we did sort of for internally for ourselves for every time we had to answer to this for what the latest research was, but we hadn't updated it for a, a long time. And we're finishing up on updating our, our sort of internal white paper that synthesizes all the published and unpublished material in regards to these treatments and what, it, what might happen with freshwater mussels. And there's been a lot more research recently, so it'll be good to have that updated just for us to be able to react to some of these uh, permitting issues when they come up. Um, and then the only other real news I think for listed species that I have right now is that we didn't we have no interesting new records for any of them, but um, except for um, what's yellow banded bumblebee it underwent, it's listed as threatened, and it underwent um, a pretty good rebound for a while, um, maybe for about a decade or so, and it seems to now just be holding on at lower levels now. It, I, you can find it pretty scattered around the state now, um, versus in the year, maybe in 2000, 2001, and two, you couldn't find it anywhere in the state. Now you can find scattered records of it around the state. We find maybe 100, 150 records every year around the state, but it's nothing. It's not nearly back to what it was back pre 1990s. Um, but it's you know it's good news that it's actually holding on and has actually rebounded a little bit. And I'm hopeful that maybe it can rebound even more further south. It's not rebounded at all. And there's thought that it has something to do with colder, cooler climates. That it's actually doing better in those climates um, than it is in warmer areas further south. Um, and then there's just a few highlights of stuff that some of the members are working on that really helps us out. Um, the DEC has done a lot of muscle surveys that really helps us out on the West River, um, especially for brook floater where we're considering critical habitat designation. They've done uh, in the summer, last summer, they did a lot of muscle surveys there and found a couple of stretches of the West River that had um, not only brook floaters, but also six or seven other species of freshwater mussels that were pretty abundant on these stretches. So some of our ideas about maybe designating that area as critical habitat looks like based on some of the surveys they did last summer would be really warranted for, for that stretch of river. It's a little complicated with a dam being above it and some other things. Um, what else? Uh, there's The DEC also has been working with uh, Luke Myers at SUNY Plattsburgh and working on stoneflies. And there's a couple of stoneflies, it turns out, that are very rare and only known from a couple of specific locations and habitats in Vermont and actually in New England. And so we're actually finally getting some good data on, on that group when it comes to rarity and being able to understand which species we might, we might look at further, thanks to their surveys. And then the biggest one I wanted to talk about really was a project between <clears throat> Fish and Wildlife Department and the Vermont Center for Eco Studies and others, we wrapped up about huh, five or six years of wild bee surveys across the state. Um, we've got, we've discovered, I don't know, 50 or 60 new bee species for the state. Um, 
including some that now are only known from Vermont and, all, and nowhere else in New England. Um, I think there's eight species we have that are super rare um, like that. And we have enough data that, as I said earlier, that we working with the agency, we now have um, S ranks for, oh gosh, 335 of them, I think, out of the 350, something like that. So we're well on our way to understanding which species we need to really look at more carefully and maybe even consider in the future um, for listing if, if there's any declines or changes. Um, and we have 55 species that we put sort of on a watch list for that based off, sort of based off of um, species of greatest conservation need. They would probably be those species that we'd really um, probably add to the wildlife action plan in a few years when that comes up, um, that would be these 55 species. So long story short, um, we, came, we jointly came up with a, a sort of a state of the bees report for Vermont. It's online, and when you look at the, you can follow that up and read all about everything we know about wild bees in Vermont now. We sort of put it all in one place, um, so we'd have an idea where we need to, we need to go in the future for understanding some of these species and some of the conservation concerns we have for them. Um, and there's a link for that in our report too. And then the last thing would be uh, is that this year we're, for once, we're actually going to be able to start collecting data, comparing a whole group to a couple of decades ago, and that's the Vermont Butterfly Atlas starts this year. Believe it or not, it's been 20 years since the last Butterfly Atlas, um, which was the first atlas ever for Vermont. And we're, I think we're the first state to ever repeat a Butterfly Atlas. And so for the next five years, we'll be doing the Butterfly Atlas also um, in strong partnership with Fish and Wildlife um, and others. And for once, we'll have a really nice comparison of butterfly changes in abundance and occurrence across Vermont over a couple decade period. So it'll be a real boon for us to understand um, where we need to point some more conservation towards butterfly species. There's a lot of other details, but you can hit the report when I give it to Alan, he puts it up and read about it. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ken. Appreciate all that work. Um, Ron? Yeah, just a couple uh, quickies. Uh, elk toe mussel, do you, given how hard it can be to survey them, is there any sense of the population size there? There's 13 of them. No, I'm kidding. I, I have no idea, Roz. That's <laughs> okay. I'm probably wow. giving it. <laughs> I think that's one of the things we're working on right now is understanding like what the population was every time they surveyed it. I don't really, it's pretty small. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's in, a, and then, I think it's in a very short stretch of river too. Like it's only, there may be only like, I think it's like a kilometer long stretch of river or something. It's not very big. Uh, yeah. And then for the, the amphipod, are there any, uh, one, are there any threats to it outside of humans entering the cave system? And is this an example of a potentially super resilient species when it comes to climate change? <laughs> yeah. I think history, if it survived the glaciation, I think history shows it's pretty resilient. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the two threats are one, as you said, entrance to the cave, which spelunkers are definitely going into this cave system. They've mapped it all out. But it's, oh. but the thing is, is to get to where the water really is, there's a crawl space that only, that the meek will not go through. It's just big enough that you have to turn your head sideways and crawl like 20 feet. Um, yeah, so you yeah, barely yeah, you have to push yeah, your helmet yeah, in front of you. I'll, I'll bet I'll bet you could get a, I, I bet Alyssa Bennett would go through it, no problem. Oh, I'm sure, but <laughs> we got two people. Thing, yeah, Joel will do it too. Well, like, <laughs> yeah, Alyssa's smaller though. <laughs> the good news is is it keeps a lot of people from getting to this big lake that's there. Um that's down past that. And so it would be contamination from people that are going into this lake that could be a problem. But the real concern. The reason we start looking at the critical habitat designation potential is because the real concern is, is water um, pollution infiltration from above. And so what's going on above this cave is really probably the biggest concern. Yeah. Thank you. Paul? Hi, Ken. Hi. So what's a pea clam? You know, uh, it's those finger pea and fingernail clams, those tiny little clams you find in vernal pools mostly, but in oh, other, okay. 
yeah, there's, I can't remember how many species. I just worked on the data set. There's like 35 or 40 species known for Vermont, it turns out. Oh my God. Yeah. And um, there's a pretty good data set from DEC from occurrences of a lot of those too. Um, and so there's a bunch of them that look like they're probably gonna be like S1 species. And whether they're S1 just because they're naturally rare or not, and you know they might not be declining or anything, this might be just naturally rare species too. So we're just at that level of just barely being able to rank them. Right. Can they be identified without dissection? They mostly have to be identified by looking under a microscope, yeah. All right, we're not gonna see them in the restaurant menus anytime soon. Huh? It would take a hell of a lot of them to make a good clam chowder. <laughs> Those local whores, though, you know. A small knife. <laughs> thanks. Carla? Yeah, thanks. Um, pardon the rookie question here, I guess, but here we go. Um, under a critical habitat designation, um, is the ESC sort of officially part of that process or even unofficially part of that process when a, a petition or recommendation is made? Yeah, we, we're fully officially a part of that. So it essentially is, it's like a listing, essentially. Great, thank you. Any other uh, any other questions for Ken? Uh, residual hands, real hands. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, how do folks feel about? So we we are at um, we are at lunch break time. Do people want to keep rolling? Do people want a break? Do people need to go get food sandwiches? How are how are people feeling? Roll with it. Yeah, he just, roll. You can roll. I just need two minutes. One minute just to walk around the corner and grab money for lunch. So yeah, because the okay. weather's getting dicey out there. I think. Okay. Is it? Yeah. Well, that's what I. They have a, Put it out. Is it? Right there. Right there. And they're saying ice and right. stuff like that. Okay. Is it snow right. or rain at this point? It's rain. Now it looks snowy. Okay. Did it already turn over to rain? Stay long enough. It'll actually. I'll be nice. Yeah. Okay. Matt, why don't you go ahead and keep rolling then? Sure. Okay. Um, you all right with me presenting here, Bob? Sorry? You all right with me presenting? Yeah, you're right, whichever. Like I asked, Bob wrote the Florida report, so I do <laughs> acknowledgement <laughs> there, which I greatly appreciate Bob taking on a, a lot of the uh, such tasks for Ag Flora. Um, so uh, we continue to have uh, a very active and good sized membership uh, in Sag Flora. We've got uh, 12 active members and, and 10 folks uh, often attending. Our meetings, so uh, great uh, interest in the group, and it's really a, a great uh, sort of, uh, opportunity for the Vermont Botanical Community to come together, advising on particular uh, permits and so forth. Um, so we, we met three times during the year, plus a uh, summer field uh, meeting, field trip, uh, which I'll, I guess I can talk about a little bit as we come down the the report. Um, our officers listed on the report, and then uh, in terms of the uh, listings, delistings piece, uh, we don't have anything uh, currently uh, proposed. Although we've had discussions about several potential delistings, uh, and we maintain sort of an active shortlist of possible uh, candidates for listing when we sort of uh, have the time and capacity to advance those or consider them further, uh, we continue trying to chip away at a little bit of the, the field work supporting those um, dedicated search. So uh, there may be some listing and key listing proposals coming to. And on the, well, I guess before the, the 
ending piece, uh, we did have uh, again a couple of unpermitted takings of listed plants uh, towards the year. Uh, one involving Greens Rush and a GMP right of way project. Uh, actually, I guess on state land, uh, Pine Mountain WMA, uh, and then uh, uh, Great St. John's Wort uh, in the Laboyal Valley Rail Trail uh, in Fairfield. Both of those notices of alleged violation went out and had some uh, you know, response from the uh, involved parties making various attempts to, to mitigate the damage and or at least uh, adopt better practices in the future to avoid such uh, unpermitted takings. Um, and then I, guess I won't go through the permits in any great detail, uh, but we had uh, five uh, permits issued that came through this group. And then as we discussed earlier, the Rose route, and we'll consider the plum uh, later. So continue to have a fair number of permits come through the group. I think so. I'll touch on that later. Uh, so our summer field trip, uh, we had uh, good attendance. Uh, I guess what six members, and and we actually had uh, a number of non-members come as well, including some botanical folks up from Massachusetts uh, that contributed to the the outing, um, which was at at Great Ledge in Fairhaven, uh, Nature Conservancy owned property uh, that has many known rare plant records. Um, and uh, we managed to update a number of those. Let's see, I guess Bob has the numbers here. Um, we had we documented seven uh, new rare species occurrences at that site, uh, updated uh, two of the listed species records, and I guess uh, some of the additional uncommon species as well. So it was a really productive trip, both in terms of actual uh, data gathering and just sort of interpersonal exchange. States. So that's an annual field trip. It continues to be a productive as well as, as fun activity. Uh, then uh, I guess uh, going on to sort of extra items here, um, we had a number of um, notable rediscoveries over the past year. Mm -hmm. um, you probably heard about a couple of them that, that made pretty decent splashes in the media, which is great for plants. Uh, it doesn't happen that often. There is the uh, discovery of or rediscovery of the small world begonia, which is a federally listed species. Um, got some great PR on that. It was uh, previously last seen in 1902, so uh, it's been quite a while. And actually, I think the only historical records of that actually are are not even an actual pressed specimen, but simply a photograph of the plant mm. actually in a pot. Unfortunately, it had been dug up. Um, so great that that has been rediscovered. And I don't know, did, Bob, does that, do we get some additional federal resources now that it's actually been redocumented as occurring in Vermont? Support? Uh, I mean, it's not a slam dunk, but we can put in for Section 6 funding now. Or there's something there. Yeah. Anyway, um, another highlight of rediscoveries was the purple crowberry up on Mount Mansfield. Again, uh, it's been over 100 years since that was uh, last seen. Uh, so, not every day we get to move multiple species, or not every year we get to move multiple species from the sort of extirpated or long historical category back into uh, our extant uh, species in the state. Um, uh, a couple others, Bob, put in the report a, a, a population of Tories bulrush from uh, Lily Pond, uh, again, over 100 years uh, since it was last observed. Um, marsh or mare's tail as well, an aquatic plant from the Somsic River swamp, uh, last observed in 1895. So some of these things are, are still out there. They just need people to go back and look for them uh, again. And since we had not had a new bryophyte tag yet, uh, we've included a couple of new bryophytes for the state in the report. Uh, things that hadn't been documented in Vermont previously. No common names here, but Tetrodontium ovatum, which I'm sure you're all intimately familiar with. Um, this is one I found actually in, in Marshfield. Um, it was 
last documented from New England and I think actually from the contiguous uh, United States only in Maine on Katahdin uh, about 100 years ago. Uh, so uh, a significant discovery new to the state and, and back in the region. Um, it's a teeny tiny little thing that occurs in dark crevices, so very easily overlooked as well, not surprisingly. And then another uh, moss down in Bennington, Centricio Papalosa, the new record for the state uh, that occurs on, I think it's on a sugar maple from moss. Hmm. Uh, then, as we do every year, we one of our meetings is sort of a co-meeting with the Native Plant Trust, where we um, sort of main purpose being to review uh, of our rare plant monitoring, uh, both what's happened in the prior year and proposed actions for the coming year, uh, both in terms of surveys and then seed collection, the, the seed bank that they maintain that we discussed earlier with the uh, in relation to the Roviola. So that continues to be a, a really critical partnership for accomplishing rare plant monitoring uh, and, and seed conservation throughout the region. Uh, there's a uh, work on uh, ranking updates. Uh, Aaron Marcus has, has really uh, been the, the point person uh, keeping track of all of this and, and moving it forward. Uh, Aaron, uh, well, I guess, well, uh, they came out with uh, an updated version of the state's uh, uh, rare plant list for uh, in 2022. Uh, last list was 2018, I believe. Uh, so it was good to get the official list updated. Uh, we've been incrementally updating these things, but that's not sort of the official published uh, list that's out there for folks to reference. So it's good to get that, and I think we've already made some additional updates to that now. Um, and Aaron has also been um, sort of informally maintaining a list of species that we have concerns about long-term declines for, and of course having uh, adequate data is always an issue um, in trying to make these determinations. But Aaron's been doing a great job of trying to pull these things out so uh, we don't lose track of them amidst the many species we try to um, keep track of. Uh, and I guess just the quick nutshell there is 11 of those species uh, their decline appears to be related to development. Five, the decline appears to be related to pathogens, and 42 of them, most of them, they seem to be declining, but uh, we don't know why. Or, I'm sorry, no, I got those numbers wrong. 63, uh, we don't have a specific attribution for uh, the cause. 11 due to development, five pathogens, and 42. Uh, we think they're declining, but we don't have really adequate uh, documentation. And Art provided, Art Gilman provided a, a little bit of an update on Vermont's flora numbers overall. Art, for those uh, who don't know, is the flora or the author of the new flora of Vermont uh, that came out a few years ago, the most recent sort of technical manual to Vermont's plants. Uh, and since 2019, he's accumulated uh, records for 20 species new to the state. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, more of those are non-native than native um, to North America. Uh, maybe most significant among them is a, a new species that will be considered uh, rare in the state, uh, Appalachian gooseberry, Ribes rotundifolia. That'll be an S1 ranking, occurs nearby in New York and so forth. It just had never been documented in Vermont before. Uh, Jerry Jenkins found that this past year, I believe. The new non-natives in, include curious invasives like uh, Japanese stillgrass, unfortunately. Some other, some other species of note there, uh, a large stand of American lotus, uh, Nalumbo, uh, which is sort of a puzzling thing. We're still trying to figure out what to make of it, whether it's sort of well, I, I this last uh, information was that it probably was deliberately introduced, although not obviously in a properized way. Although it's native to North America, it can sort of weedy and become problematic. And then a, a last item among the, the various other topics we've we've discussed is uh, uh, the ongoing need for a, a native plant nursery. Uh, region-wide, there's more and more demand for 
seat of local provenance uh, for a variety of types of restoration and site planting work. Uh, and it's been uh, a challenge for those who have been involved to, you know, make this work uh, economically um, and, uh, and to, to figure out the right sort of scale for this. And it's, what does local providence really mean? You know, is it 100 miles, is it the whole region? Uh, that sort of uh, issue. Um, and so there's sort of renewed uh, interest in, in discussions and efforts around that. So, uh, I'll leave it there. And if there are any questions? Thanks, Matt. And just, and just a comment. I found a co-chair of the group. Um, Beth Becca heard this um, when we had a meeting Friday with the, the secretary's office commissioners and all the agency directors. Um, you know, regular meetings on certain policies and procedures. But I was doing my fish and wildlife update. One of the one of the the only one I actually got to um, there on my list was talking about the discovery of those two plants we ceased. And it was amazing how it generated a lot of positive. Mm -hmm. The air was just a lot of energy of discussion from a lot of people there that started a Maggie gender. How many exactly what you said, Matt? Uh, we do hundreds of press releases during the year. Between all the departments and agencies, there's several going out every week. And she received more comments and all positive in nature on those two press releases that we did on those species. Mm -hmm. um, stuff. And Bob, you're here to bring it. So I'm mm -hmm. sure that day, if you were or anywhere in the vicinity, but it was a nice, um, and it gave us a chance for the department to myself to help the uniqueness of uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department is. Um, despite some of critics say that the department had the foresight to hire a botanist way back, because um, most of the states aren't there. Some are starting to get there. And, and, your second point is really interesting to hear about that. That's me because um, if we were dealing with Robo Pass right now, I'd be going, "Whoa, there's an interesting um, one." That, that I think for many of our taxes, that we have certain facility needs that Robo money could be used for. I like, I say, um, I like this group and, and state agencies being responsible to drive it versus private entities. Just for the discussion you had earlier about the seat paint. Um, from that individual, and, and we've talked about the need how you know these critters we find with turtles or frogs or things like that. That that no, you just can't kind of do this with them or release them over here due to all these different ecological reasons. But that would be a really interesting project too, because what's going to happen is when I'm hoping Rava does get passed, us and many of our neighboring states in the north northeast are going to be struggling. To find those immediate projects to get on the ground with minimal staff involvement until we finally get ramped up for staffing, which which our state agencies Achilles heel. It's ours, I, you know. Just, we're not the other states are still in the same boat. You go through so many hoops and political processes. Yeah. That's an interesting. So don't try to uh, positively think that there could be resources coming hopefully soon to to address things like that that normally probably I would say would make my priority list for what we need to do for plant conservation. But if it means the idea of, of for policymakers and people who don't think like we do that want to get the money out quick, it would I would think would be very something to think about and discuss as a rule. It, it's yeah. a major need that we've identified. I mean, That's when good. I'm reviewing permits and they want to do plantings, I always, yeah. I mean, I, we require native plants and I'd suggest a, a local provenance. And they often come back and say, we can't find any you know, plants locally grown or lo of a local yeah. uh, source. So they're just Thank you. They're planting things from from Michigan. And actually, I was back, I was meeting with folks um, about your recommended plant list. Oh, yeah. The tree list. And they get a lot of them, a lot of the woody material comes from Oregon. So, I mean, oh, <laughs> right. talk about local. I mean, yeah. You know, well, what is it, you helped me on the Japanese knotweed to respond to the commissioner. Yeah, there's a place where they're grinding it up and selling it for people to, to recover their properties. And this yeah. person was a yeah. septic system. And yeah, I want our opinion. And at the bottom line, after providing the resources you got me, you know, it's answered for the commissioner's, commissioner's friend somewhere, some other former work. I said, uh, if it's personally me, I'd be quite concerned of spreading, you know. Any type of material that has not weed in it. This is also a proposal we're reviewing to uh, do some kind of uh, experimental plantings, range extensions in, in, in Groton. And 
you know, I mean, the, the plants are all native to Vermont, but so we asked, well, where's the source? I said, as long as they're locally <laughs> sourced. One was from Pennsylvania and the other was from Michigan. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And they said yeah. that there are no, there's no source in Vermont of these of these common plants. One was white oak and some of the hickory. It's like, it's crazy. We closed, that's not work going on. We closed yeah, the state nursery, what, like 20, 25 years ago. That was the dumbest thing we ever did. <laughs> it was great for soccer. No, I mentioned it to people. Mark, I think that this, we can coexist here. We yeah, have soccer. I, know. Know. Sure the tree I mentioned it to people who play, and they, you know, that's why they call it the tree farm. Yeah. That's what it was. People have forgotten. Yeah. yeah. Was, so for plant, so at the level of trees too, you know, for rest, all sorts of restoration, that's been a big need too. And I know that discussion has come up in a number of venues. Uh, so. You know, there, there, that those those groups could probably bring in a lot more money and or support to help bring along, you know, a, a native plant nursery as well. Yeah, the restoration watershed groups and everything like that. I mean, if you don't get your order into the intervale in October oh, and November, you're just yeah. picking up. New Hampshire's the only state that has a state tree nursery. I, I yeah. think locally at least. And I've floated a lot of acorns. Yeah. And, hickory. and I put a lot of hickory, but man, those things don't stick to the bottom. Maybe two out of the hundred that I've tried. Uh, Cody, my thanks. That it's a, this is done. I don't know, maybe you folks have reported this before. before. It just never resonate with me, but it wow, it's something I just. It's Thank probably the first it. time keep it, keep we've been on the list. It's yeah. probably the first time I included it in well, the well, report. Well, but it. it keeps coming up and up, and it's. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like a supply and demand thing. I mean, the, the suppliers say there's no demand, and the, the you know the applicants say, well, there's no supply, and it's like, well, <laughs> we got to work. Maybe we have a new uh, repurposing of the Essex office Ooh. in the in the making. <laughs> oh, that's where the tree farm was. <clears throat> that's right. Or the oh, fire. I know I shouldn't bring it up, but the the buildings that we we don't own, but BGS is struggling mm -hmm. too. Oh, with all the state, the Windsor, you know, Windsor. Oh, yeah. Well, we we'll get to that. Propagate the long wind stems is getting here. Yeah. That's, yeah. My, that's my learning. Um, I was I was just going to say, you know, given what we're hearing from all the SAG, I mean, you know, somewhere every SAG, I think, has a good news story. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, if we should also be thinking about publicizing some of those, you know, some press releases on, you know, whatever, you know, whatever cool, you know, cool bees discovered in, you know, Vermont, um, you know, good nesting success of common terns, whatever, you know, whatever that might be. But, you know, I, I'm guessing it's not just because it's plants, but people want to hear some good yeah. news. So, yeah, they really do. Um, That's you know, been our effort lately, yeah. Alan and, and it's you know we certainly some luck the old buying any information we could just be just two people trying to follow me for decades. Yeah, you're limited to what you can do. Yeah. But now there, and I credit those folks. As I said, I think I said that back over back me at the agency. That's why. Yeah. And and you know other state our sister organizations in the agency by Jell and Sussfire staff. But mm -hmm. the reality is, as much as um, I'm always seeming or get more critical than that, we're so you know. Archaic in our management programs, we internally made those conscious decisions to not build certain. Most of our problems are to deal with that, but it's they're they're getting there. You know, we got a, a bunch of new positions, so for time, I'm hoping that but we definitely got to get them on like the speed thing. You know, that, that we just heard we should be jumping on that, getting that. Yeah, no, I think that keeping folks um, connected. To yeah, exactly. So, uh, let's see, Paul and Stephanie. Yeah, just a comment and then a question. Um, you know about the native plant nursery world. I have a little bit of direct experience with that. I have a young fellow who I've been working with for a while, who's a accomplished nurseryman and he's been looking for a place to start a native plant nursery for over a year now and um, you know the limitations to that are are 
you know, maybe not obvious, but um, land prices and finding good um, viable um, land that you can have a nursery on, um, particularly in in like Chittenden County, um, where he wants to live, um, is really difficult. It's got to be, you know, a light loamy soil, which is also the best place to put houses. So there's, uh, you know, this guy's ready to go. I mean, he wants to do this. He's certainly capable. He even has some financial backing and um, it's a land limitation. So think about that. Um, my question was, I don't know if there's anybody still here from the ag department, but it's kind of a big picture thing. You know, we, we have these invasive species and I'm, I'm thinking about, um, oh, you know, emerald ash borer and what that's going to do to the, the state's forests. And, uh, um, you know, as I cruise around the state, particularly in Chittenden County, I'm seeing, um, you know, oriental bittersweet. I guarantee you in 10 years that plant is going to be covering a lot of the state of Vermont. Um, it's just popping up all over the place. So the question is what, um, you know, what are we doing about trying to, you know, look at um, other pests that attack, attack these, these um, invasive species, you know, that may be native to where they're coming from and, and trying to, you know, be a little bit proactive about getting on top of, of uh, um, you know, introducing some of the species that can control some of these invasive. I, I know like loose strife, purple loose strife, that was seemed to be a real problem. And, you know, that beetle was introduced and it seems to be, um, you know, I don't see much of it anymore, which is kind of great. Um, so it's a funding thing and it's also a priority thing. So the question is really, you know, what are you guys seeing in the sort of, you know, agency level that um, is addressing the need to spend some money on being a little proactive and, and trying to get a handle on this stuff um, before, you know, before it's too late. So I'm still here. <laughs> um, and uh, and I actually had comments and questions too. And I'm going to address your first scenario about the native um, nursery person that wants to gain access to land. So nurseries are considered farming um, and that individual can certainly contact the ag dev um, division of the agency and see if there are any programs. Um, access to land, I would recommend contacting either the Vermont Land Trust or um, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. They do, um, well, the Land Trust specifically does um, sometimes take ownership of land and then try to transition another farmer onto that land, conserved land specifically. Um, obviously, you, you said there were some limitations in the type of land that this individual is looking for, so I, I can't speak to that. Um, but um, the other thing that I wanted to mention about the definition of local, so I'm dodging your last question, your question, because mm -hmm. I don't have enough information about it, but I'll get to it. Um, the other thing about the definition of local, so I, th I feel like because people are using the term local in the planting of um, trees, th they don't. there is no definition that governs. We have a local foods definition in the Agency of Agriculture, and if you're not within, and I, I don't know it specifically, but you're either within the state of Vermont, obviously that's local, locally produced. But if you don't tie a marketing term and enforce a marketing term, then it's hard to develop an industry in the state of Vermont that focuses on local. So, so there's a little bit of marketing there, I think, as well, um, possibly. Um, and we, and again, we have examples in the Agency of Agriculture how it applies to food, um, and to to not use that word local if it it doesn't have meaning, or if it doesn't have meaning, you can use the word and it doesn't make a difference. Um, so, so that's something I wanted to mention. And then the other thing. Um, so now to your question. Uh, biocontrols. Um, so the a the agency does not currently have any money in any budget um, that exists in order to address the introduction of biocontrols um, into the state of Vermont. We do have um, we have invasive species um, uh, laws, not just weed laws, so specifically related to 
plants uh, that we do enforce. Um, and I heard Japanese knotweed mentioned earlier in some application. And so I'm curious about that. If someone who I think, I think it was Mark who maybe mentioned that about using it, <laughs> um, please email me. We can talk about it offline because um, it's it, you can't actually do that <laughs> uh, in the state of Vermont um, and the agency would regulate against that. So I, I'd be interested in knowing a little bit more. I don't have enough context, so I'm not gonna um, pass any judgment on what was mentioned. But um, for biocontrols, we can allow the introduction of some biocontrols with permits. Um, but as far as like research being done at the agency, the agency doesn't have a research division that looks into insects from um, other countries from the, you know, the origin of the plants in order to see if they're effective. I, but there is, I think there's funding maybe at the federal level um, but I don't have enough information. So what I can do, and I'm, and don't take this as gospel, um, but what I can do is I can find out more information and maybe make a short presentation at a subsequent meeting. So I can answer that question better. Yeah. So I guess, you know, one of the questions was, is are, at your position, are you like jumping up and down at the federal level and saying, hey, you guys, you know, we got some issues here. Why aren't you spending more money on these biocontrol um, you know, projects. Uh, it's, it's, we do know, participate in some economics. Yeah, in some yeah. level of advocacy at the federal level and um, requesting funding for specific things. Um, I, I can't say that we've done that um, specifically for, you know, with our congressional delegation, um, but specifically for um, advancing biocontrols. Um, so not a lot of jumping up and down. We do a tremendous amount of surveying um, for pests specifically federally controlled pests there's there's money and um that gets allocated to states you know based on application by states um from the federal government the uh, under the plant protection act um and then there's also the cooperative ag um survey that the agency does um so we we try to survey uh pests insects pests um primarily um so the em emerald ash borer would fall under that category i guess you mentioned that earlier um asian longhorn beetle um potentially slf a little unsure at this point as far as um in getting information from from judy rozovsky who's the state entomologist uh so we're active but maybe not as active on the biocontrol piece but i again i will definitely look into it and get some information to you great stephanie a quick follow-up on um on local locally sourced yep. Uh, plants. We, we we realize that's a nebulous term and it's actually on the agenda for the next floor advisory group meeting. We're thinking of like a northern New England adjacent New York uh, Providence. Now, I, we, we totally get if you make it, you know, too small, it's not going to be commercially viable. But if you make it too large, it kind of loses its significance. So it's a kind of a, you know, you know finding that balance. You know, the other thing is, a lot of nurseries will say, oh, this was grown in Vermont, but they got the seeds from Michigan or Oregon. So that doesn't really help us very much. So it's, it's gotta be, you know, from a Vermont seed source. Yeah. So, yeah. So we need to make some clear definitions of what we mean by by local and maybe there's a better word, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah no, really totally. Yeah, here. no, I, and um, I, I'm not, again, I, I think it's exciting. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting work and I'm glad that you're all working on it. Um, and if you, uh, not that I can lend anything, actually, I don't think I can, but <laughs> happy to engage in conversations. We'll, we'll be in touch. I'm sure you can. Yeah, okay. and I can I can touch base, Stephanie, and, and see if you might want to present something on invasive species and some of the work the agency is doing at the next meeting. Yep. Bill, do you have a, do you have a quickie? Yeah, I, I do. I, I, I think it's great to be presenting some good news on things, but I think we also need to be um, making the public aware of some of the dangers that are out there that are going to face um, our wildlife and plant species in the future. And the mammal sag started looking at threats uh, to the T and E listed species. And many of the things that we came up with are environmental contaminants. And maybe that's because both bats are insectivores. spores. And the marten and the lynx are carnivores, so they're kind of high apex uh, consumers, but these are real uh, threats to them and something we need to consider. So, um, yeah. 
just those last words. I think the public is not really aware of the things like the uh, testosterone mimics, the estrogen mimics, and what they have to do with, with at least with wildlife and how they can affect them. Yeah, anticoagulants, another big one. Yep. Yeah. yeah, rodenticides. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, that uh, negative support. Rich? Okay. Um, we met only once last year. Uh, previous to that, we didn't meet in 2021. Um, the last time we met in person was 2020. So I decided it, um, in the fall it was high time that we got together. Um, at the present, we have uh, six members, and I'll be presenting um, the ESC today with uh, two more potential members. Um, anyway, the the main reason I, I called the group together um, was not because of relisting or Lamperside or anything, but it was in response to request um, to start thinking about prioritizing species uh, for conservation efforts um, that would qualify for RAWA funds. Um, so that that took most of our discussion. Um, talked about the administration of it, you know, who would who would be involved. And it appears that quite a few uh, governmental and uh, non-governmental entities could be involved with this. Um, so we got right down to after discussing that. Okay, what what are we going to do for for what species? Uh, what are our list of species first? Um, so we started with the SGCN group. We looked at um, their listed species, our special concern species, and and what occurred to me um, initially was that um, the uh, 18 out of the 20 species that are listed, fish species that are listed or on the uh, special concern list, um, they're distributed on the very edge, the eastern edge of their distribution. So naturally, we're going to be, a, uh, we're in a position um, uh, geographically to be concerned about these, these, these species. Many of them are located, and I'm probably remember this because I've said it before, uh, many of them are restricted uh, below the 150 foot elevation in the Champlain Valley. And uh, that elevation represents the fall line, which is right now a barrier to most to most species. Um, given that, um, the uh, potential for habitat improvement um, or extension um, is is very limited because these uh, these particular species are are only found in our very largest rivers, and um, which implies, of course, very large drainages. So where where are you going to start? Um, we decided that um, the primary impacts at this point would probably be sediment um, and uh, turbidity. Um, most of these species require clean sediment. Um, there's always a possibility of water quality issues um, related to storm water. Um, the uh, potential um, fixes would be something like a more restrictive um, buffer requirements um, that are um, um, promoted and enforced by the DEC. Stormwater regulations, funding improvements to agricultural um, operations, and of course, citizen education. Um, these are these are not new, <laughs> um, but uh, you know this is this is something we come up against all the time. You know, especially when we're looking at you know restoration work and and um, things things of that nature. Um, uh, additionally, we had um, lampreside. Uh, as a uh, specific stress to American brook lamprey, eastern sand darter, stone cat, and channel darter. Um, one of our new prospective members attended, uh, Mark Henderson from UVM. He um, has quite a bit of experience in eDNA testing, 
uh, environmental day and, uh, DNA testing for the presence of, of aquatic organisms. Um, SAG showed a lot of interest in this. He also presented some information on um, new, um, new ways to assess habitat as a proxy for uh, the status of, of uh, various fish populations. Uh, we discussed some of them, some of it, some of it uh, fairly um, high tech uh, involving side scan uh, sonar. Um, so it was, it was a pretty inter interesting discussion. Um, along the way, we decided that um, our current um, fisheries records or fish records we have for each species, anything that's over 20 years old, we're going to try to begin to resample uh, those and confirm that either they're there or, or they're not there. Um, and this, this would involve a lot of money. Um, and it also would imply that we could be um, using some eDNA work as well. Um, both UVM and DEC now have laboratory capabilities. So I'm, I'm really looking forward um, to investigating what, what we can do. Um, right now, uh, the lab is involved at UVM with uh, uh, putting together some tests for round goby, which is, of course, an exotic and not quite here yet. Um, let me see. Um, Fish and Wildlife Department conducted a three-year um, channel darter, eastern sand darter, stone cat study between 2017 and 2019. It was very well designed and it uh, covered most of the large tributaries to Lake Champlain, which have been treated um, with lampricide. Unfortunately, <clears throat> they ended the project in 2019, the year when lampricide work was going to begin on the Vermont side, um, begin another cycle. Um, would have been nice if they'd have done it in 2020. We would have had a before and after um, uh, idea of what was going on. Um, but uh, the SAG, the SAG group kind of wondered, hmm, um, a little suspicious that they stopped at that point. Um, so uh, let me see. We added four new species to our special concern list. They are moon eye sauger blueback herring and blueback herring only occur in the uh, Connecticut River, northern pearl dace and quillback. Um, so let me see, that's <clears throat> just about it. Any questions? Thank you, Rich. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. We do have, um, well, let's go there. Any uh, any questions for Rich or the work of the fish sag? I might uh, add. I would like. Uh, go uh, ahead. Yeah, Alan. I might add that um, we don't. There won't be no lampricide applications on the Vermont side this year, um, and there wasn't last year. Uh, but next year we're going to be plenty busy. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do also have uh, two new SAG members to um, <laughs> vote on. I guess, let's see, we have, do we still have a quorum? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so I think we're good. Um, are, are people comfortable with voting or do you want me to pull up the CBs? Did, Folks have a chance to look at them in advance. I could go this through the. Our, I could summarize. That? I could yeah, summarize both of them. Okay, um, Mark Henderson um, is uh, the new uh, Co-op Fisheries and Wildlife Unit um, leader at UVM. Uh, he's been there since summer. Uh, prior to that, he was a Co-op Fisheries Assistant Leader and Leader at Humboldt State in California. Um, he taught river restoration ecology and ecosystem modeling uh, in California. Most of he's got multiple uh, publications. Most of the work has been with uh, Pacific Fisheries 
uh, hake and flounder, um, Pacific salmon. Uh, he has a lot of eDNA experience. Uh, to me, it's a no brainer to get him on the group. Um, that's pretty much it. He has a PhD from uh, College of William and Mary. The, uh, do you want me to just stop with him and we'll vote individually or? Uh, yeah, sure. We can go one by one. So, okay. Uh, any other comments on? Uh, well, maybe I'll ask for a motion to uh, add Mark to the fish sag. I move Thanks. to add add Mark to the fish sag. Okay, take that as a second, Stephanie. Uh, any further comment or discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Okay. Aye. aye. <clears throat> Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, and then uh, Will. Okay. Rich, Will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Will Eldridge um, is currently um, an aquatic habitat biologist with Fish and Wildlife Department. He has a PhD from University of Washington, many publications. Um, a lot like uh, Mark, a lot of publications on estuarine <clears throat> work um, with Pacific Salmon. Um, he's been a lecturer at a few universities. Um, what impressed me was that he was an AFS, uh, American Fishery Society editor, uh, he is, and he's currently a referee with uh, Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences. So he's quite involved with, um, on the publication um, seen. Um, I guess all, that's all I have for Will. Again, um, very well qualified. Um, both of them are younger than most of us on the fish sag. We're kind of getting a little long in the tooth, so it's going to be nice to get some um, younger guys in. And um, in terms of uh, the technological aspects, um, eDNA, side scan, sonar, etc. Um, so, yeah, this would be great, great to have them. All right, uh, motion to approve uh, William Eldridge, member of the fish sag. Thank you, Matt. So moved. All right, get a second. Thanks very much. Any further comments or discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Sarah and Gail, are you here with a permit? Okay. All right. Well, I think yes. um, I'll just I'll just give you a heads up. We're we're behind. And I think what I'm going to do is just go ahead and have you go ahead. And I, I can flash through it and folks can okay. make it stuff. All right, and um, and then we can go over to the um, to the permit conversation. Um, I will just give folks a heads up. We may have a guest appearance from the secretary, and I'm going to pause to give her the floor if that does happen. Not sure if she'll be able to show up or not. So take it away, Mark. All right, uh, bird sag. So we met uh, twice this year uh, in the spring and in the fall. Um, as far as our membership is concerned, um, I'm, I'm not sure. I wrote in the report that Roz, you had stepped down from the sag, but I don't know. We already have two state representatives on the sag. I don't know where Roz fits in all of that, Mark. We are going to lose Doug. And we are going to lose Doug, but I'm assuming that that will be replaced. Personally hired will yeah. be on yeah. the tag committee. So, so I'll let it. We'd love to have Roz stick around. Oh, whatever. She's juggling a lot of stuff. She's remarkable. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, my blessing, but not to her. No, I'm happy to stick around at least for a meeting or two as the new person is brought <laughs> in and gets up to speed. Okay, who's, that sounds good. Who's, when you said two, you meant me and Doug? Yeah, so I'm, I was okay. assuming Doug would be replaced, but John Gobell yeah. is on the committee too. So All right, John. We, okay. 
Um, as far as species listed in 2020, 2022, uh, we had good news and bad news, but uh, in the spring, uh, metal arc was listed as threatened. And the good news is bald eagle was delisted um, from the endangered species, endangered or threatened species list. Uh, and the common turn nesting islands were designated as critical habitat. We didn't have any proposed species for listing in 2022. We were updated on the status of the avian influenza by Dave Sawsville. Um, and things seem to be uh, decreasing regionally, but the state is kind of sticking to their guns on, on how they've moved with that virus. Um, as far as recovery plans are concerned, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies is working with the department to develop uh, recovery plans for Whippoorwill and Eastern Meadowlark. Um, these plans should be ready for review at the SAG in the April meeting. Um, so hopefully we, we may have something for you in the summer or fall meeting um, for review as far as those recovery plans are uh, listed. And um, the bald eagle delisting plan has been completed and accepted by the SAG birds. Um, and uh, I don't know if that needs to be the Endangered Species Committee certainly should, is welcome to see it. I don't know if it needs to be approved. The Common Turn Plan, which was written back in 1996, was approved and signed off by the Endangered Species Committee. So that was a recovery plan. That was a recovery uh, yeah. plan. Oh, not a posty listing plan, right. Yeah. Send it to us. OK. <laughs> um, you may already have it, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, also, uh, and as far as recovery plans, I did review um, and update the common turn recovery plan, which was done in 1996, uh, just updated the data um, and we uh, looked at that. So I've been working with Doug on that. We'll present that to the uh, scientific advisory group in April. Uh, as far as our species, loons did well, falcons did well, ospreys holding their own. Um, I don't need to go through all the numbers. Uh, we've kind of stepped back on falcon and bald eagle surveys uh, away from surveying everything, uh, all the cliffs and nest sites to trying to develop surveys that we can um, follow the um, numbers and productivity patterns for those species without exerting all those efforts to cover all of that. So we've been working with Doug on that. Um, yeah, we had 40 pairs and produced 42 fledglings for bald eagles. So they're um, they're doing it well because not all nests were monitored. Um, common terns uh, did well this year. Uh, they rebounded from last year when a peregrine falcon showed up on the island. And uh, we had um, Roughly 190 pairs, which is up from the 160, and we had a really good fledgling year this year. So uh, right now they're still, um, based on their uh, adult population, are above the down listing levels, but we've still had some concerns about reproductivity and reproductive success, and are in discussions about how we view that as part of the recovery plan. Um, no survey, oh, no. Well, black terns was the one that kind of uh, floated to the top for us um, up at Missisquoi, the only known uh, population, only none, 29 pairs were observed. And there for a while, we were floating around 100 pairs there. And um, Judy uh, from the refuge who monitors that um, had a host of problems getting around and trying to identify um, or find the birds. They didn't show up in a number of different places where they had, but she had boat problems, stuff like that. So uh, I think Doug is now working with some of the state wardens maybe to help her out with. Oh, we did. Okay. Um, with the yep. big old swamp boat or whatever yeah. they call it. That uh, folks are where you need to be. Yeah. So, uh, and members of the SAG also said we'd assist in any surveys to really get a feel for the numbers. So that's 29. Yeah, other states are also showing declines. So hopefully we'll have a better assessment of that population by the end of next summer. Bruce Grouse, Rusty Blackbird, um, no surveys, no data, common night hawks. Um, we still get a lot observed along the Connecticut River during fall migration, but no documented nesting. 
Sedren, we did have two birds, what, in Rutland Marsh for most of the summer. Yeah. Um, we weren't able to determine whether or not they were a pair or not, but no. And then grasshopper sparrows, uh, numbers seem to be lower than previous years with only five males at Camp Johnson. Um, and then um, unfortunately our surveyor who usually does Franklin County Airport didn't get a chance to get out there this year. So Margaret Fowl looked at eBird sightings and we have about six birds that she could find there, but those could be some um, undercounts from that population because we were just relying on eBird. Normally the numbers are up around 10, between 10 and 15, somewhere around in there. Um, Whippoorwill surveys were conducted by VCE. Jason didn't provide any information, but the gist of it all is um, <clears throat> the areas down around uh, in Western Vermont, the Fairhaven area is still the highest concentration of those birds after, I think this was the last year of surveys that they conducted. And that's the takeaway is that seems to be where the birds are and they're kind of scattered elsewhere. And then Eastern Meadowlark, um, VCE continues to work on that. Um, they did surveys this year and estimated about 96 individuals um, across 37 occupied sites in the state. So um, that species, uh, and as I said, they're developing the recovery plan for that, which I think is going to shoot for maybe 150 species, probably far fewer than there were 50 years ago in the state of Vermont. but. Um, we're wrestling with with the recovery plan. Do you shoot for those previous high numbers or do you define, find a minimum number that you're content with um, so that the population is still occurring in the state and is stable? So those are some of the questions being bounced around. Uh, we had no changes to our species of special concern and um, I will remain chair and Al Strong, vice chair, with Margaret as our secretary. Mark, are you or rather some entity still euthanizing cormorants out on the island? We are. We've we've never had the permit. We're under the permit to remove gull nests and cormorant nests on the Turn Islands. Uh, we haven't had to do any cormorant nest removal. Uh, we do do some limited gull nest removal on the Turn Islands. Um, it's the state that's doing as that's all under the state's um, piece there. And I'm I'm assuming will be a focus of work at uh, Lazy Lady Island. Is it some work last year? Last year. That we were going to purchase it, we went through. Yeah. And that'll be interesting because um, I've seen gr uh, black crowd night herons there at that site. And of course, they. Lady Lady. A lazy lady. I've never documented them nesting because I haven't gone on the island, but they like to eat turn chicks. So, you know, if they were to stay there, great. So, you know, all for it. But, you know, if they were to move somewhere else, I, I wouldn't. It's only there's they're only about 100 yards away, the two islands. So are there trees left? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, the island and I won't go into detail because we got folks, but the, the um, some of the trees are impacted pretty heavily and there's a lot of just junk that's growing up very low but some of the trees out there the cottonwoods and the oaks out there are just really impressive it's definitely just one of those islands that was nobody ever farmed it or anything like that and uh it's a it's a it's a very cool place so it'll be interesting to see how things change over time um with the work that's going on and that's that and I, I, Jim, I went, I wrote this thing and it was almost two pages long and I cut it back to a page and a half. <laughs> <laughs> the race to the bottom. <laughs> okay. I'm following what Sally did years ago when she was the SAG chair yeah. and I'm just using her format and it's kind of like boop, 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 pretty bullet like. I kept ours to two and a half. Pages. And we and and Mark does, has a uh, a nominee for the, the yes. Say. So Jim Arbruster, who is uh, currently working at Vins and is their field coordinator for some of the conservation activities that they're beginning to pursue down there. Uh, he has a degree from um, UVM 
and um, our tent has been somewhat small. I think we only have eight members at this point in time. So, um, you know, he's also a rehabilitator as well. So uh, we uh, looked at his resume and and came with the Big Ten approach. And um, so we're presenting him as a uh, potential SAG member to the ESC. Yeah, and I'll I'll just say, you know, this has been it's been sort of a conversation. It's been a conversation here as well as in the bird sag. Um, I mean, Jim has a WFB Walnut Fisheries Biology degree from UVM, um, but is not, you know, doesn't have an advanced degree, has not been, you know, publishing. On the other hand, he's, you know, actively doing field work. They've been doing some putting some transmitters on wintering. Um, rough-legged hawks, red-tailed hawks, and trying to understand winter movements, habitat use patterns. And so, you know, from my perspective, I thought, you know, despite the fact this is not, um, you know, someone who's got a, a really, you know, doesn't doesn't compare to, say, Will or, or Mark, the new uh, uh, nominees for the fish sag, um, but, you know, brings other organizations into the fold and um you know and i think it just expands the reach of the bird sag so yeah any other uh any other well it, uh nomination for uh jim armbruster for the bird sag i'll show a little bit yeah. second yeah all right any other any other questions or or comments? Very done. Uh, all those in favor of adding Jim Armbruster to the bird tag signify by saying aye. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's everyone. So thank you all. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Yeah. Could you all uh, right. catch who who motioned and seconded? Uh, Mark, Mark Scott and Matt Peters. Okay. All right. I think um, for now, John, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over you on permits, and we'll the permit report, and we'll go to the um, the uh, furnace Americana. All right. Okay. So this. Is Permit is for the taking of uh, American plum, which is a state endangered species. It's probably a state threatened, excuse me. Uh, it's S1 G5, so it's rare in Vermont. It's common um, throughout the US. Uh, it's, it's uncommon in New York State, but most other localities, it's, it's yeah, it's at least somewhat common. The the taking is for a proposed UVM outpatient surgery center in South Burlington. And right now it's pretty much an old field setting surrounded by a lot of residential and industrial. Um, the taking will be due to the proposed parking area. And the parking area, I've been told, they don't have much flexibility because there's a, a number of other rights of way on the property that they have to deal with, including there's a Green Mountain power power line that goes through and they, they're not allowed to build up beneath that. And then there's also a Champlain water district pipeline, so they can't obviously can't dig um, in that uh, area. So it kind of limits where they can go. And obviously. Being an outpatient surgery center, they I suppose they want the parking as close to the building as possible because people are obviously going to be, um, you know, you don't want them to walk too far after the surgery. Uh, Art Gilman and I were out there. Uh, I guess I guess it was early December. Um, it's very cold and windy, so it must have been. Uh, and we counted about at least 70 stems. Now this is a clonal species, so our assumption is it's a single individual and they're all interconnected and they're kind of in this, you know, it's like this hedgerow or this, um, yeah, I guess for lack of a better word, it's a hedgerow 
uh, it kind of in the center of the site and the plants are all kind of clustered in there kind of at one end of that. It doesn't, they don't encompass the whole thing. Uh, but as I said, they need to, they need to take the entire uh, population uh, consisting of probably one individual and 70 plus uh, plants. There is also some potential that these plants are not natural because uh, American plum is used in the horticultural trade. And I went online and you can find nurseries that sell it, but there's no indication that this was planted. It's obviously been there for a while because it's, it's, it's spread. Uh, so, and I, I went back and looked at aerial photos going back to 1999 and it was there. So it's been there at least uh, with that 20 plus years, but for what that's worth. Um, so we discussed this at the Floor Advisory Group meeting and we asked for some additional information from the applicant and for some modifications, which they provided. And then we just voted on this electronically. And uh, I heard back from five members, and if I include myself, that would be six six members who um, who actually all supported issuance of this permit uh, with with some conditions, which we can go into. But uh, the applicant is proposing moving. Originally, they were going to move five stems, and the advisory group thought that was uh, not enough, so they upped it to 15, but most people came back and said they would like more than 15 stems moved with the caveat that we realize the bigger the stems, the more difficult it's going to be to move. So move as many stems as, as is practical. And, it, you know, at some point, somebody's going to have to decide what, what's practical. I mean, we can't be moving. It. I mean, it's not a big tree, but it, it's a certain, you, we all know about moving trees. The bigger the tree, the more difficult it is to move. And then a couple of uh, folks wanted the plants moved to more than one location on the site. And um, I propose that to, to Gail, who I guess is on this on this um, <clears throat> conference. And um, she came back and, and said that that they had to plant conifers in in the area the other areas, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'll, I'll let her explain why they can't be moved to multiple sites. We're also asking that seeds and or cuttings be taken. Uh, now, cuttings have been proven to be very difficult to uh, to establish, but the problem is the, the work would probably occur uh, next fall. And so we could potentially collect the seeds you know next fall before the work begins but it doesn't necessarily produce fruit every year or if it does apparently uh, seed predators get it because when we were out there we saw no no cherries whatsoever I mean it's, it's probably the squirrels and the, and the birds nab it pretty quickly so the cuttings would be a backup so we would it, cuttings are best taken during the dormant season, so we'd probably take the cuttings like late spring before dormancy broke, uh, store them somewhere, but we wouldn't try to uh, establish them unless there was a failure in, in the uh, in seed collection. And the seeds would only be used as a backup in case that the, the transplants didn't uh, succeed. So the idea is to collect the seeds and the cuttings and then give them to the Native Plant Trust and use them only in the uh, in the case of a, a failure of the transplantation. Yeah, go ahead. Are you saying cuttings would be stored, but not? Planted? Well, I don't, or are they going to stay viable? I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I thought if they kept moist and cold, you could actually store them, but maybe not. Um, um, For months yeah, maybe months. Art knows more, but yeah, I haven't I haven't spoken to NPT about that. Um, I know with the uh, Theonothus, they, they didn't try to establish them immediately. They were stood, uh, kept cool and moist, but yeah. Uh, that might be. Yeah, 
yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. And there's also some landscaping issues. It was one potentially invasive, but that's that's more of an Act 250 issue than a T and E issue. Uh, so I'll just leave it there. And I don't know if you want um, Gail or Art or Errol to speak, or if you all have questions, whichever. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's good. You brought up the you could reduce that. Oh. If you yeah. Could, yeah, if you could scroll that, I just want to show them where the plants are and where they want to be moved to. But yeah, can you? Yes, yeah, just whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that that square, that rectangle, that's where the plants are now. And that's you see, it's at the edge of the proposed parking, and then where. Where Alan was before is up at the top of the screen, and that's where they're going to move to be proposed to be moved. It's along the edge of the site. There you go. When they move, be moved with that one big. Yeah, and you know, Art, well, I've Errol know better than me um, how to, they're going to move them. So um, around the edge, I mean, the ones in the center are fairly large, 15 feet tall. So around the edge, going out into the edge of the field. Are these we presume that they are underground runners that then shoot up and those are uh, probably very vigorous and uh, will transplant well uh, with minimal height uh, you know being younger plants vigorous at the moment but I th we think that those will transplant very successfully <laughs> to taking a large thing and trying to you know even a large thing you brought Cut it down and so forth. It's probably uh, one interconnected mass of roots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also so the advisor group suggested that since they put a lot of attention into a, a number of them, but then the rest of the mass, whatever you might get out with the excavation for the parking lot, could be moved to that same area and just kind of set in place without really trying to. You know, transplant them individually and seed mulch, but maybe put them as a larger mass and just bark chip around. And yeah. you know, a lot of times, maybe Paul would have some ideas on that. But you know, I would think that plums are, they're not, most woody plants are not delicate, shrinking violets that are hard to drain. Yeah. So we're thinking that that will be okay. And so, about the second site, um, there wasn't a second area on the site. Gail can speak to that, but we did increase the area of that was originally suggested. So there should be quite a lot of plants. It should also be mentioned, because Errol Bray speaking, that it wouldn't be a stem that's moved. It's going to be a mass, whatever can be lifted by a loader. Yeah, so you're going to go for the whole run. All yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. The real being that you know, it's, it's probably all one interconnected mass. Yeah. I think that's what we're asking for yeah. is just to kind of move, you know, whatever you can. I mean, obviously, the bigger ones in the middle that aren't mentioned are going to be less viable and much more difficult. And the area, does the area is is uh, would allow further expansion of that. If if they took root and they got established or that tree got established, it would. Yeah, there's a fairly good area there where it can. It can go if, you go, can go, so if you can go, if you can. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to address that. If you can um, pull up the plan, that would be very helpful. Um, yeah, so it, it's a hedgerow now. It, it, it's located right now in an area of where the old foundations for the uh, old farmhouse and barn were on the site and there's still an existing windmill there so it was all around the homestead for this property of where it's located right now um, the site is more or less open with the exceptions of um, the the hedgerows along the property lines throughout the permitting as as a uh, art um I'm sorry, as Bob was saying, you know, going through the permitting process and the design of this site is very, very tricky because there's a hundred foot uh, right of way through the middle of the site, directly through uh, the property for um, Green Mountain Power. And it also has a, a, 
I'm sorry for um, uh, yeah, for Green Mountain Power, and then there's a Champlain Water District uh, right of way. So those really limited the site in terms of how things could be laid out and where things could go. And then as uh, going through the city of South Burlington permitting process, uh, there are some additional requirements that were added onto this property, including a future road connection on the northeast corner of the site and uh, a, a connection from the parking area to, to that roadway, as well as a, a, a bike path connection. So the site is, we've pretty well, you know, utilized a lot of the site in terms of trying to figure out a spot where these plant plants could be transplanted to and not be in the way of any future uh, roadways or development that this uh, northwest corner made the most sense where there's nothing is going to be occurring in that area. We have extended it as a fairly large area. I think it's over 150 feet in length. So there's plenty of room to spread out the plants. But this is a, you know, an outpatient surgery center that's being run by the, the medical center. So it, we didn't want plants put all along, around in different areas on the site because it's a, it's a maintenance issue for uh, the, the property. Also along the Northern property line, we were required to put evergreen trees in as part of the development review board approval uh, because the abutting property is a den going to be a densely developed, developed residential area uh, on that side. This is all part of an area in the city of South Burlington that's being, has been and will continue to develop into a high density area. This is the last of, of the, one of the last lots within the Mountain View Business Park to be developed. So it's just to kind of give you context of where this all is and what's going on. But that that's what we've uh, come up with and proposed. Uh, to, for transplanting it, as uh, Art and Errol said, we will be, you know, working with them to relocate the plants as much as we can to that area, along with soil and doing um, the seed collection and um, cuttings. I'll say too that that is, is the habitat is equivalent. Where they are now, mm -hmm. so there's nothing that would. Yeah, the soils are the same. Uh, the areas, the yeah, the soils the same. The areas open, similar to where they are right now in the middle of the site. Gail, yeah, just just remind me what what is proposed for, uh, like north of the parking lot and where the plants are proposed. Is that just going to be mowed lawn? It's going to be a meadow area. Yes. That will be mowed. It's not going to be mowed lawn. It's a meadow. That's how it'll be um, handled and treated moving forward for maintenance. But it'll be brush hogged. brush hogged at least. You don't want woody plants in there. I don't know whether the intent is to brush hog it, but it, it will be probably mowed once a year to keep out tree species. Okay, we're, going to mark on the, we're proposing to mark the edge of the clump because obviously it's spreading out of the counselor and therefore maintenance of the brush hogging would be prohibited next to the transplant. Exactly. Yeah, we'll either put we'll put some type of a barrier there, whether it's a, a boulders or fence or something to protect the, the transplants. Uh, I get uh, go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah, I, I just comment about, you know, the transplanting, um, you know, rosaceous plants can be really challenging to move, um, especially something that's, you know, probably one big um, underground mass of rhizomes without a lot of fibrous roots to it. But I would suggest, you know, um, one really big um, um, front end loader to try to just move as much of the clump as you possibly can with as much soil would probably be the, the highest uh, survivability scenario and uh, cuttings are really challenging. I I just look, looked it up in my plant propagation root book and January hardwood cuttings rooted at about a 7% rooting rate. So that's pretty, pretty low and that's under ideal environmental conditions. 
you know, so um, it's pretty low rely reliability. Um, yeah, so just a couple comments. We will plan to use a um, backhoe and move the plants. We'll be working with the contractor for the project. Yeah, front end loader, big front end loader bucket. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Scoop it, scoop it right up. Paul, you want to you want to drive it? I could, I could. It'll be fun. <laughs> we'll do that, that in the turn. Yeah. Three hundred bucks. Yeah, an hour, Stephanie, so you got a deal. Yeah. Yeah, I had a um question regarding um. Uh, longevity or or the I, I'm not looking at the permit conditions right now, but whether or not there's a well, actually, I'm going to defer to what the South Burlington condition was with respect to their evergreen screen to the north there. Do they require some like, you know, checking in over three years to ensure that those trees survive um, for the evergreen and whether or not the Endangered Species Committee is interested in a similar condition so that there's at least a, a time limit for establishment regarding this transplant or not, which is fine. I just, just an additional potential condition um, associated with the permit. And then my next question is, and I think I may have misheard, is the, um, the species of uh, plant, is it a, um, it's, is it common in the nursery trade? And if there is a problem with transplanting this particular species, is there an alternative? And maybe there isn't. So I, I just, I just remember reading that it's common in the, the nursery trade and, and whether or not if this plant from the site doesn't survive, if there's an alternative method um, to establish it on the site. Yeah, so Stephanie, we, we routinely require five years of monitoring after any uh, T and E transplant taking. And uh, that also entails monitoring and control of invasive species. Uh, there's also uh, watering would be required. Uh, so when the plants are, are moved up until the end of the growing season, they would need to be watered the, the first the first season. So that's pretty much routine. So that's why we, okay. we didn't specifically mention it. Uh, All right. As far Thank as you. getting, I missed it. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's okay. And as far as getting backup plants from a nursery. I mean, we could do that, but again, we have no idea what the provenance would be. We may be planting things from Michigan or Oregon, who knows? Uh, so yeah, that would be the, the concern. Understood, thank you. Do you think it was part of the old farmstead? I mean, how did it get there? Well, I mean, this is yeah, a plant of one. kind of old fields okay. and hedgerows and things. So the habitat is, is not inappropriate by any means. And where we're finding it is in the Champlain Valley. So this, you know, it's, as I said, there's no evidence either way. I don't think we will ever know. It's like a lot of, you know. Well, if we can find someone's diary, planted land. Right. There. <laughs> there you go. It wasn't found though on this site or any of the neighboring sites that are, were also open and part of this whole area of uh, farmland. For whatever reasons, it was only found on this site near the foundation, the former foundation of the buildings. Birds can be an effective distributor oh, yeah. of seeds. <laughs> and there'd be That's no true. reason why they wouldn't keep it, you know, it produce plums. Well, we're talking plums, so they're pretty big. Yeah. It doesn't look like there you there's no way you're not gonna transplant a ton of bittersweet if I'm interpreting this picture correctly. <laughs> is that just a model? Oh, is that what that is? That is great. That's great. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh. Yeah. The <laughs> but that's the only one in South Burlington. That doesn't, doesn't have bittersweet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Any uh any additional questions or comments? Um Good luck. I mean, Carla or Matt, any, uh, any, I mean, you've already weighed in on this. Anything you want to add from the Flora SAG? I guess I would just throw out the larger perspective that, you know, in, in most scenarios, we hope for or, and, or try to have there be less than 10% take of a population. And here we're looking at 100% take um, with a portion of the plants moved. So this is, 
kind of a different level of impact than we usually uh, I guess consider or favor, but the site constraints, obviously, there wasn't really a, a way around it. Uh, and I guess we think that the species is could, adaptable in, in this circumstance. Could those cuttings be a project of the intervale? Yeah. If you are going to take some cu cuttings yeah. and put it, you know, as far as trying to propagate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that's a, a good idea rather than just NPT. store them. But, you yeah. know, because they do a lot of that as far as dogwoods and all sorts of other things where they're using cuttings to begin the process. But if they rooted them and, and they wanted to sell them, would they need a permit? <laughs> <laughs> Collecting fruit with having seeds be better. In fact, we don't know that they'll be fruit right, we don't seeds know available. So that's where cuttings would just be in yeah. case. It's like a backup book to backup. Right. But if you're going to go to a different, you know, offer them to other people for, for yeah. their fruit purposes. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, I was just, I was, I was just thinking that if it was something that the cuttings could be grown and yeah. even if it has a low, um, Chance and you get two of those cuttings to get initiated, you could plop them back out on that site yes. as yeah. well. And it just would be a source for that particular site. And the Intervale has um, the, you know, they do that kind yeah, of stuff they have the expertise. in that. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm guessing, Matt and Art, if you and Errol, if you agree, I mean, I'm guessing these plants reproduce and, and produce you know, plums. It's just that well, probably the squirrels and bird feed us to it. Well, I have I seen them, well, I've seen them elsewhere in Vermont in fruit. Uh, so yes, they do fruit. But you know, Prunus nigra, I I've seen that, and it doesn't seem to produce a lot of fruit every year. Well, most many yeah, all kind of they, like apples are the same way right. every yeah. second year and so forth. Right. It's hard. To yeah, it's like every three or four years you get yeah. a bunch of Prunus nigra, and then other years there's practically right. nothing. So. Hopefully the last year was a bad year this year. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of fat squirrels out there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they're and they're quick. Oh yeah, they, they seed comes down and. Well, uh, the only thing here is it, it's relatively um, isolated now. It's out in the middle of the field, so. Um, if there's depredation I mean, of birds, I think. Yeah, yeah it's probably, probably birds. birds so it's yeah, probably a long ways away for a squirrel to hike. Hey, uh, Art, are these self fruitful? I mean, uh, you know, a lot of fruit trees need to have Not another. Really the only place, well, the one place, all that I've seen them elsewhere, I'll admit that I think that those were a planted thing, that they were in the sort of a uh, roadside, um, semi residential area, um, like between a couple of buildings that were right on the road edge. Uh, they were in very heavy fruit one time. And um, there weren't many of them. Yeah. Uh, there may be 15 stems, and they were just loaded down with fruit. So I sort of presume they were a clone, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. All right. I guess I'll uh, I'll ask for a motion uh, to approve the uh, permit with the conditions. Proposed by the floor saying. So moved. Second. All right, I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any further discussion? All right, hearing none, uh, we'll call the vote. All those in favor of. Uh, Moving forward with the permit and uh, with the conditions from the floor sag, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. It passes. Thanks. Uh, thanks all of you for coming and uh, talking about the project. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, 
John, do you want to you want to say a few words about 2022 permits? Sure. Um, so I don't know if you folks have looked at the letter I sent as part of the, the package or in your in your drive summarizing permit uh, endangered species permits issued last year. Uh, I tried to to summarize them in a variety of different ways, but uh, mainly uh, you, only a, a handful of them actually came to your attention at the time of the application uh, for your review. Uh, most were ones that you have agreed had agreed to approve as as uh, a class because they were either renewals of existing permits. They they had very low potential to actually impact uh, a species um, or were follow the protocol that you had previously approved. Uh, so there are only a few uh, new ones and th those we talked about at the time, uh, but the the list of the spreadsheet that's included in the letter sort of covers all of them and their status. And I don't know if you want to go over them line by line or just see if there are any questions that came up first. Let me know what works best for you. Uh, I'll say overall there were 24 applications received. Uh, half of them were new. Some of them were renewals or amendments. Uh, and then a couple that that are sort of in, still in process haven't been issued yet, like the one, like the Rosary one that we rediscussed today. Here, so um, I guess I'll just ask about the. So this would probably be helpful here, I think. So 24 new permits in these categories. And we are, I'm just not familiar with the numbers, which are the ones. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, see, no, that's yeah. Okay. so that, yeah, I tried to explain it. So yeah. type one is, it, it comes from an old ESC guidance yeah. document. And yeah, I mean, I know it's, a, it's up above. Change or update those, but basically type one or, or Dead stuff in museums, uh, or or you know, um, Fairbank Museum has a, has a, you know mounts of a bald eagle, or or the you know uh, specimens in the in a botany uh, in a botanical uh, uh, museum, things like that. Uh, generally, uh, they. They, they were either collected, you know, maybe salvaged uh, dead animals that were salvaged or they just been in the museums for, mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. Uh, sort of also in that category, we put uh, the relatively new permit type, the, the ones that were collected for cultural uh, purposes, the this uh, allowance for uh, Abnaki uh, tribal members to collect dead bird specimens for, for their use. So that, that sort of type one, the ones that sort of fall into collection uh, for education or research is what they call type two and A being uh, renewals and B being uh, new ones. Uh, and then what we call type three are the, the taken for incidental purposes, basically generally development yeah. issues. So ours are, I mean, essentially these sort of 16 are the ones that we do. Correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yep. And then, so uh, there may be, I'd say there were a couple new ones for say a bat, bat surveys or muscle surveys. But in those cases, the, the protocols for doing those surveys are standardized and have been reviewed and approved by this group enough times before that you said, as long as they, you know, the the people doing the surveys are, you know, meet our standards and they're following our protocols, you don't need to see those in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, just look at them as a group at the end of the year. And with the idea that being some some of these things that we 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 may batch as 
approved as a class, you may want to adjust that, you know, what what fits what's allowed in there or add a new class group or something like that. But uh, it was a relatively light year. I, I think what happened was the previous years under COVID, a lot of people were, were stuck in their offices and they cranked out a whole bunch of applications. And in the previous two years, there were a lot more applications. And then finally people got out in the field and they really didn't want to sit, you know, they didn't have time to write more applications. So uh, it was a light year for permit for endangered species permitting. Yeah. A lot more scientific collection permits, but those are applications, but that's a different story. Yeah. And so I will, can can we say that the 16 here, 2B and 3, mm -hmm. are 8 and 8, or not necessarily? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Curiosity, if Fairbanks Museum needs a permit to display their dead endangered animal skins. How come the Pringle doesn't need a permit to hold all of its endangered plant specimens? Um, it probably I does. want to create more permitting problems. Standard. It just occurs to me. As well. <laughs> so, so sorry, I, I was pointing at it, but they probably should. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been tracked the time to track down every entity that has such things. Um, I mean, there are there are official repository for such things. Correct. So <laughs> technically, they sh they they should have one. But you know, so we issue a Fairbanks Museum has has you know permits and Southern Rock Natural History <laughs> Museum and, and Vins and Echo all or what you know other places that have you know a, a you know museum exit uh, specimens. Dave are, Barrington might be on our general permit. That could be. No, that wouldn't necessarily cover that situation, yeah. but but. But it it they, it should there should be one recognizing that they're there. Uh, we could stop. I could stop the presses and go and give them a call. Not trying to create headaches. Bring something it's back to you tomorrow. Time. But no, it's a good it's a good point. Those historical things are not taken. Right. It just seemed like a mismatch. Correct. I mean, and, and, and it it gets murky. You know, some of these things have existed, like the much of the Fairbanks. Collection and some of the Vermont, uh, the Southern Vermont Natural History Museum's collections, all were acquired before there was even a federal Endangered Species Act. Right. Uh, but so, do they? And it may be different for animals. And stuff. And, uh, the, the law is sort of is sort of silent on that. But in general, we want to say you know you're authorized to possess and exhibit these things. And in theory, we say you know, and we say. Send us an annual report on changes and what happened. You know, if you've added to your collection or or gotten rid of stuff. Um, so you know, yeah, maybe we'll try to remember to send a note to the Pringle folks. And I won't mention I won't mention your name. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, it's a good point. <laughs> and they're not the only. I, we, we we even issue one to Bill Kilpatrick for all the, the stuff that piles up in his. In his closets for you know <laughs> eventual genetic <laughs> research, right? Oh, uh, this is great, John. I appreciate it. It's good. Um, the categorization of all the permits does sort of further point out how the rhodiola permit doesn't fit nicely within the yeah. existing framework. That we have. And, and then, you know, it's, it's part of our problem of trying to put everything in boxes um, just for the sake of our brains, but not mm -hmm. mostly for the sake of nature. Right. Any any questions for John? Happy to take them by email later or if you want to follow up or want more information on any of these, just let me know. Yeah. What you need for that? Uh, no. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Great, Alan. Yeah. Just around the rodeo. I think you already discussed that. Yeah, we had to move it. We moved it ahead because uh, we had some. Yeah. Um. We're going to general counsel to figure out <laughs> what our, what makes sense moving forward. Um. It was, I mean, basically the bottom line was really, does it fall within the categories under which we would um, actually 
um, discuss a, a intermittent take permit. We weren't exactly sure. So we're going to check with Catherine. If uh, Catherine says no, we can't do it. Our our um, our thought is to leave it on uh, in Bob's court um, to make the decision about um, using the native oh, uh, native plant. plants. Yeah, 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 yeah. So hopefully they'll make a decision for you, Bob. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, and there yeah. were a few other conditions we kicked around. Well, but hey, well, I'm going to adjourn here. So thanks, everyone. I appreciate your time. Uh, input and uh, I think everyone has the April date on a calendar, but that is again. Yeah, yeah. Alex, can you make sure that Julie Moore is on that your email blurb that goes out? Oh, yeah, um, I, guess, I didn't catch it. Um, I guess the last time she was on the uh, the email distribution, unless you, yeah, you got to find a list of all of us, and I just didn't yeah. catch it. Yeah. Every yeah. place there. You see, well, Penny would April, organize these meetings. April 25th. Well, there. here's what happened. Penny usually does. Sarah, I worked with Sarah, and she did. This case for us to help Sarah, her office is that we set the room and meetings up, and by us doing that inadvertently kind of left Sarah on the loop. So, and Al, therefore, I just. Real, realized I revised the report. Uh -huh. I just realized that I had bald eagle listed under. Okay. Okay. That's the recent thing we covered. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, anyway, I just moved to send it around. Okay. I just sent it to you. So, okay. Alan, before. Before report documents. Yeah, go ahead, Roz. Before we adjourn, um, there's one uh, last very important item uh, which was not on the agenda um, in light of the fact that we'll soon be recruiting for a new botanist that means we're losing our long time very important botanist and i realized that he's <laughs> his retirement date is actually like three days before our next meeting i thought he had one more esc meeting but this is his last esc yeah. meeting and obviously we'll have um some sort of retirement party. Maybe we'll wait till May when we're assured that it could be outside um, and we'll have a chance to laud him with compliments then. But I wanted to give people the opportunity to, you know, make any remarks after having worked with Bob on this committee for um, 33 years. Is it Bob? It oh, you, you'll keep coming back, Bob, right? <laughs> you know, come on, this is exciting stuff. <laughs> I have extracted. I'll skip the annual stay engaged in, in the forest. Oh, great, great. I'll skip the annual reports now. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> you, yeah, well, you already seem to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I would, yeah. I would just say, Bob, you you have you He's have blown trainer. my mind many times about your <laughs> unbelievable knowledge of the plants of Vermont. Oh, and um, yeah, um, just uh, it has been a pleasure having you in these meetings. It's yeah. really great. And uh, I, I mean, you know, I was thinking, you know, when Matt was talking about, you know, the Flora field trip, I was thinking, that sounds like so much fun. And then I'm like, I'm sure I would just crush some endangered species out there. I'd be, I'd be a liability on those trips. <laughs> well, we'll just don't right out. No, I, I don't know how many times when people have brought up uh, plant questions and I'm like, have you asked Bob? Bob? Have you been in touch with Bob? <laughs> we, we probably flushed a lot of rare birds on that trip. That we didn't, didn't notice. So I think they advised on any rare rattles or any rare uh, I want to open that up for the people on the Zoom to be able I think to that's, Bob. I think that's where Paul is. Oh, okay. Yeah, Bob. Wow. I didn't, I didn't realize that this um, is coming to an end. That's kind of a folks like that. Peter Sweet moment. Um, 25th. Oh, and I guess the one thing I remember about uh, Bob that was always great was um, the day he and I went out in the canoe to um, look. I was going to show him where the Anticlea was, which was the um, uh, death camas that I had found that hadn't been seen for what, a hundred years or something like that. 
and uh, Bob had to get out and actually get a sample of it. And he was perched precariously on the top of this cliff while I was still down in the canoe. And I was thinking, oh my God, this, this is kind of serious stuff. He's trying to reach down to grab one of these specimens. And, and uh, fortunately, he, he, uh, you know, he didn't slide into the lake and he probably wouldn't be here now. But anyway, um, your dedication was just, um, you know, pretty amazing. And I, I have to say, I've just learned a ton from these meetings and, and your insight and knowledge about the, the flora of Vermont has really been... Uh, been great so yeah thanks for everything and it, it's kind of yeah like i said bittersweet that you're you're leaving us but i'm you know i'm sure it'll be more fun for you right well thanks paul i i knew you were down there to pull me out of the water if i fell in <laughs> you hope and so you know, kudos to you you're the one that found the plant yeah well and, and recognized yeah. that there's something really special yeah how did you get up there on the cliff to identify it in the first place? He didn't. <laughs> no, you could see, you don't have to get up on the cliff to see it. I can't divulge too much more information about it. This is top secret he, stuff. But <laughs> He sent me and Art Gilman photos. Yeah. And Art and I called each other and said, you, do you think this is what I think it yeah. is? Like, I hadn't been seen in 100 years in the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it was pretty obvious. I thought it was like, wow, what? Can't believe these guys haven't seen this for a while. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well, that was great. It pays to have eyes out on the ground, Paul. We're learning yeah, that yeah. more and more. Yeah. You know, with the with yeah. the small world pagonia and the crowberry, it's like, you know, the more people that are looking for things, the more things we're gonna find. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good luck to you. Have fun. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Drive safe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Get to a window. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah.